The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Stock Market Authority Podcast. I'm Bakes, Kevin Baker. I'm going to teach you how to make money in up and down markets. Very few podcasters or coaches cover this. I'll show you how to lock in profits and minimize losses to make you a better investor. So once a week, you're going to know what's going on in the world and the stock market. Welcome to the Stock Market Authority Podcast. Good morning, everyone. This is Bakes, Kevin Baker, Stock Market Authority. It is 10 o'clock on Wednesday. Great to see everybody, and I uh, hope you're hearing me uh, loud and clear. Uh, obviously, uh, we're going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank, the failure, what happened, more importantly, what you should do now. Mail, the mailbag is obviously full of, of uh, uh, bank stock, as you might imagine. We're going to cover that. Uh, and we're going to go through the Stock Market Authority portfolio and, and my search for the 10 best ETFs for you to make money this year like we did last year in a, in a down market. But today's top story is uh, uh, SIVB, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, it failed, and what you should do now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, last week's Back to Basics. Let me know if you like that and, and how I can improve upon that. But SIVB, uh, that's the stock symbol for Silicon Valley Bank. And here's what happened. But more importantly, I'm going to tell you, you know, what uh, it means for you and what I think you should do. Uh, now, this isn't financial advice. You're smart people. You know, I don't know your financial situation inside and out. But I do have some, some, some battle scars that I think might add some value. Silicon Valley Bank, based in San Francisco, half of the VC Venture capital backed uh, uh, startups out there use it. Some contracts we had to use Silicon Valley Bank. It was that entrenched. Uh, it tripled in size in the last three years. And the, uh, uh, the, what they would do is that they, the, the companies would raise money, obviously very technology focused, and uh, they would uh, set up, a, they'd become deposits at um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And uh, what happened over the last couple of years, as the uh, uh, Fed raised rates, you would see the windows for raising money uh, for these firms go, you know, shrink up. The, the, the burns, the, the way the, the rate at which companies were losing money going through cash would go up, and you would see deposits uh, increase, uh, deposit outflows increase. And what uh, you know, banks do is that they, they take in deposits and then they invest the money <clears throat> in, uh, in bonds and, and mortgage-backed securities and what have you. And uh, so they would take deposits, and then they would buy uh, bonds you know, 10 years out at 1.6%, as it turns out, uh, a year ago. And uh, uh, as interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And this might be another back to basic at some point down the road. But it's just a fact of the matter is that if there's a 5% bond out there, the 1.6% bond goes down in value. And that's what happened. And as deposits, uh, uh, as, as, as people demanded their money uh, out of their uh, accounts, they had to uh, sell these bonds at a loss. Uh, they, they ate through their capital. They had to raise additional capital, sell stock. And uh, Peter Thiel, in particular, the number one investor in, uh, in Facebook, uh, tweeted and, and sent out to, to his companies and founders fund, get out, get your money out. And then, you know, uh, with, with the advent of social media, it just became a wildfire. Now, if they had, the, uh, this was not risky securities that, that they bought. I mean, these are treasuries. Mortgage backs are obviously a little bit more risky. But if they had held these things to maturity, they would have been fine. But if people are withdrawing money, you can't hold them to maturity. You have to sell, you know, taking 25, 20% losses, and then you're forced to raise, raise capital. Then what happens is every hedge fund on God's earth says, hey, run me a screen. Give me every bank that looks like they're in any kind of a similar situation to Silicon Valley Bank, and we'll short them if we can. And so that's why you're seeing Signature and First Republic and, you know, all these other banks go down uh, in concert. And um, 
What I'm realizing also is the stress tests that the banks go through don't include rates going up 5% a year. They, they talk about, and I'm going to get these a little bit wrong, but, you know, unemployment goes to 10%, we'll stress for that. Stocks go down 50%, we'll stress test for that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people that are calling for, oh, regulation, the regulators were there. Uh, you know, they were adhering to all the regulations. It's just they, they mismatched their assets and their liabilities. It was a duration mismatch. And, uh, and so, you know, as usual, I'm very cynical about, you know, the government being solution. Uh, you know, as Reagan said, you know, if you hear I'm from the government and I'm here to help, you know, grab, grab your wallet and run. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, Twitter was, is available now, you know, this, this um, uh, is, is gasoline. Now, look at the stock chart here, uh, if, you could, if, you, if you have video available. This is SVB Financial Group, SIVB. And, and I put this out last week. And I want you know, full disclosure, I didn't own this. Frankly, no one asked me about it, you know, in, in, in prior shows. Uh, but, you know, I do have a cell discipline that I bring here every single week and really stress. And it helps me, and I hope it's going to help you. Uh, if it hasn't already. Through January and March, you had all three of the components of my cell discipline triggered. You had a, uh, the stock close below the 200-day moving average. You had the 50-day come down through the 200, and the 200 turned down. And if you sold a third, a third, a third in each of those events in that two-month span a year ago, you averaged $555, 555. This chart ends at 106 because they halted trading because the FDIC sees the bank. The equity is worth zero. So you could have sold at 555 using this very simple technique if you have the discipline to implement it, which I do and I want to impart to you. And I understand that this is, this is foreign to many people, but I've been doing this for 25 years and I've, I've ridden down too many of these stocks too much so that now I know how to get out. And I really want that to impart that to you. So the cell discipline works. So please do me a favor, go to my website, stockmarketauthority.com. And when you sign up, you get a free video. And in that example, I used Amazon in September of last year, but I will teach you how to sell. And it is, it is given short shrift by MBA programs. It is given short shrift by the CFA programs. And the pros don't do a good job of it. And I've learned to do it because of the battle scars that, that uh, I've had to take. So uh, that's today's top story. Now it's time to check the mailbag. Incoming! There's a letter in your mailbox. You got mail. <laughs> Uh, Charlie from New York asked, is this, uh, Bakes, is this uh, 2008 2.0? And my swift answer is no. Uh, the reason being is that the, in 2008, it was housing. And housing was viewed as sacrosanct. And it always went up. And what happened was you had uh, lending standards get very, very loose. No dock loans, no down payments, etc. And, uh, uh, you know, housing is obviously everywhere. And so it, it's involving every single bank on, on, on God's earth. Here, it's not as widespread. It's mainly the, the, the uh, VC-focused firms out in San Francisco and this bank that, that had the, the, uh, the deposits not lined up with, uh, with, uh, with the assets. And so I don't see this as being as widespread. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, uh, Pollyanna about this. I mean, there, there are, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think it's 2008. So I wanted to answer your question succinctly. I put up Goldman Sachs uh, as an example of this. Uh, go watch The Big Short. It's a great movie. Uh, my son Jack and I, we watch it once a year. It seems like it. But just some history here, which I hope is, is helpful. Back in uh, October of 2007, Goldman Sachs traded at $250. A year later, it was at 47 at the low, down 80% plus. Now, that's how fast this can happen. And we just saw that with the, with the, the Silicon Valley Bank example. This happens fast. So that was then. And uh, now the stock, Goldman Sachs, has broken the 200-day moving average. If it was me and I had no connection to the bank, I would sell a third. 
That would be my reaction. The caveat I bring to folks who are in the financial services industry, working in a company, uh, having the company match uh, to you know the ability to buy stock in your 401k and what have you, there's other things to weigh. Number one, uh, you know, how much do you own? And if it goes away, how much does it impact your life? Um, you know, you want to show loyal to the company. I understand that. I think it's also makes sense. Take your age into equation. I know you're young and you're going to be hopefully at, at Goldman Sachs for years to come. And over the long term, it's probably going to be fine. And I use this example and brought this history to bear in this chart because here we went from 47 to 322 after the global financial crisis, and I don't think this is as bad as the global financial crisis. Now, my head's on a swivel always, and I will uh, you know, see if, if, if this does worsen to some extent, but... And you know this isn't financial advice. I don't know your ins and outs. I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, you know, be cavalier about this. But if you're worried about it, and I would, I, I call it selling to the sleeping point. If you have, if you're tossing and turning, worrying about losing money because you have a significant amount of of, of any stock, but Goldman Sachs stock, then I, I would, I would lighten up if you can, and obviously check with compliance, and you know, understand the politics of of, of uh, you know, of what you do. I get all of that, but uh, I think you're okay, and I don't like the break of the 200-day moving average, and I would watch that uh, as we go forward. Jack from New York, uh, uh, my son, asked, what do you think about UBS stock? As I mentioned before, he works at UBS, and I talked about it recently as it, you know, breaking out of a, of a significant uh, multi-year, I mean, 15-year base. UBS is holding up really, really well, uh, and and this is with horrific uh, Credit Suisse headlines going on today. The relative strength is 89, as you can see. It's tough to read on the chart, but trust me, it's 89, and uh, uh, that means it's outperforming 89% of the overall market, not just the financials, which is incredible given what's going on in the banking sector right now. So the market is saying they're in a stronger position than many other banks that are uh, based elsewhere. I've got an arrow here uh, on the right showing the 200-day moving average is still rising. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think that is, uh, I know that's a positive. The 50-day is still going up through the 200. So uh, the trend is still up uh, until uh, proven otherwise. The volume is picked up on the down days, but that's to be expected given the horrific headlines we're seeing. You got two banks seized in an, af in, in, in an afternoon, uh, you know, over a weekend. You, you know, you're going to see some selling, but the, but this is holding up really, really well, given the circumstances. It's impressive, and uh, and I would uh, uh, hold tight. There's some talk that they might uh, uh, acquire. They say merge, but it's acquire uh, uh, Credit Suisse. So, you know, in all these cases, one, one gathers what another man spills, and um, uh yeah, but I'm impressed with this so far. So I hope that's helpful. Mike uh, from New York said, "Bakes, what uh, what do you think about Truist? TFC is the, is the stock symbol. Another bank, and you know a lot of my audience are in the financial services industry. They're they're uh, uh, employed by these people, and so I want to be uh, you know particularly responsive given all of this. Uh, Truist right now is trading at uh, 3188 on when I have this chart here, and I drew this line. This is this is 10 years support." At 30 bucks, and it looks pretty formidable to me. I want it to be for everybody involved. Again, if you don't need the money, I think frankly it's too late to sell. Uh, if you need to, obviously you, you can sell to the sleeping point, as I, as I just uh, as I just mentioned. Again, I don't think it's 08. I don't think it's the great financial crisis, but I'll do the same sort of uh, analog that I did with uh, Goldman Sachs. Back then, when I think it was worse, the stock bottomed at 13. We went up here to, to 31. I think they could do that again. But I'm going to reiterate something that I mentioned uh, before. I think it is prudent to diversify away from financials. When you have plenty of exposure, your job is tied to the markets, and your stock is tied to the markets, and I would not own 
any other financials besides uh, the one that employs you. And if it's okay with compliance, and I would always check with compliance, can you own uh, something like SEF? SEF is the stock symbol for the, the short financials ETF that we've owned in the past. Can you own that as a hedge? And, and, you know, think about what the numbers work for you and if, if that's okay with everybody. And if there's a better ETF out there to, to hedge or to short the, the regional banks, I'd love to find it. I haven't been able to, and I've been looking really, really hard. So uh, I hope that's helpful. Uh, that's it for the mailbag this week. If you want to write in to the show with any questions or comments, Email me at bakes at stockmarketauthority.com. Even better, leave me a voice recording and we can play your question on the show. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll take a look at the Stock Market Authority portfolio and I'll give you this week's Bake Stakes. Do you want to become a better investor? Do you want to learn how to make money in both up and down markets? Then you need to go to stockmarketauthority.com and sign up for our free newsletter today. Stock Market Authority is run by award-winning investment manager Kevin Bakes Baker. His aim is to save you time while teaching you how to be a better investor. Bakes saves you time by diving into all the latest stock market news and information so that you don't have to. He reads all the latest articles, analyzes the charts, and listens to all the relevant podcasts. And then once a week, he gives you a breakdown of what's happening in the market. Stock Market Authority is constantly outperforming the S&P and the HFRX. Bakes is going to share with you his weekly stock observations. He'll give you concise insights and show you how to lock in profits and minimize losses. Stock Market Authority is making money in up and down markets. Wouldn't you like to do the same? So join now and let Bakes show you how. Head on over to stockmarketauthority.com and sign up for our free newsletter today. That's stockmarketauthority.com, making money in up and down markets. We are back, and today we've been talking about what to. Uh, we've been talking about the uh, failure of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and what to do now. And now it's time, but now it's time for the Stock Market Authority portfolio. And I bring this to your attention because we don't own any financials. The S and P is eleven percent financials, and we are zero. And our competitors out there, who uh, you know manage money as pros, they're going to be maybe seven percent. In financials, maybe 15 if they're very contrarian. And there are times when you just don't want to own them for long periods of time, as we've just seen. So here's what we're doing right now. Uh, and uh, I, I listen to all, I can't tell you how many podcasts I listen to and, and how many things I watch. And I'm the only one I've seen thus far that has a real portfolio, real account, and shows you here are the ETFs that I'm investing in to make money in in up and down markets. We made money last year. We beat the S&P by 25%, and I'm working my tail off to do it again this year. Now, it's early, so we got a lot of work to do, and I kind of use this analogy uh, you know, I'm an overweight point guard coming down the, the court and I'm ready to dish to the bullish side or the bearish side. And I really don't care which. I just want to be up this year. That's my entire aim. And it's, it's that for every year. So what my analysis, when I go through the thousands of charts I go through every month, here's where we are. We're 13% in energy. Uh, that's 10% of that is, uh, sorry, 10% is services and 3% is the production companies. So I want to own the drillers, the rig owners, the seismic companies, et cetera, more than, than the, uh, the E&P companies, exploration and production companies. We're 9% in Argentina, we, uh, which is 20% uh, uh, of that is Mercado Libre, uh, which is the Amazon of Latin America, which is acting very, very well. 9% Mexico, Walmart Mexico is acting better than Walmart U.S. You could do with that what you will. 9% is in an infrastructure ETF. The number one position there is United Rentals, which uh, uh, rents out cranes and bobcats, whatever, to uh, construction projects. We're 3% in platinum, and we're 10% in steel. And I know that's an unorthodox portfolio. You're welcome, because it's going to do uh, I think it's going to perform better than hugging an index, which is what the pros do, and they have to be X in healthcare and X in financials, even if those and X in tech, even if those areas stink, which I think they do right now. So we're 53% long, and then we are 10% uh, short Kramer, more on that, 
and we're 3% short real estate. So we're 13% short, so that means we're 40% net long, and we're 34% in cash, which is why I bring the, the unfortunate imagery of me dribbling a basketball down the court with 34% cash to deploy wherever the market tells me to go. And that's, um, I think, a good position to be in, and I'd rather be doing this than being in a, 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 a institutional fund that's 3% cash and can't do anything. Now, uh, the chart that I have up here now, this is inverse Kramer. Matthew Tuttle, Tuttle Capital Management. Matthew, uh, we texted back and forth last week. He's uh, uh, just launched the inverse Kramer ETF, his Tuttle Capital Management. He was a, a guest on the show, uh, boy, probably two years ago, right before he launched SARC, which is the short ARC. Uh, ETF, and I just like his instincts. His timing's been impeccable. And what this does, what you think it does, Jim Cramer, the symbol is is S-J-I-M, short Jim. And uh, Cramer, uh, you know, has a, a penchant for picking tops and bottoms and making the recommendations at exactly the wrong time. Uh, I think that there's a reason for that. He is an entertainer more than an investor, and it's a little like the Paul McRae Montgomery magazine indicator. By the time something gets from the business pages to the, and this is in the time, times gone past, from the business pages to the cover of a generalist magazine like Time or Newsweek, it indicated that the trend had come to its end. And I think CNBC is kind of like that. By the time something bubbles up so that it's getting a lot of viewer hits and, and a lot of attention and a lot of questions, the trend is probably close to being over. And we'll see how it works out. So far, we're already making money. I think it's uh, an auspicious beginning. And Matthew, thanks again. And I, we made a lot of money shorting the Kathy Wood stocks with Sark and the SPACs with Sogu last year. That's how we were up last year, one of the big reasons, uh, versus everybody else being down. And so we're going to pull all the uh, uh, arrows out of the quiver to, to, to make you money no matter what's going on. And it's vastly different from the other people you listen to, I think. So uh, uh, SGIM, most recent uh, buy, and uh, we'll talk more about it. I'll give you some uh, progress reports as we go forward. And that's how we're invested uh, here March 15th. Let's get into this week's Bakes Takes. I'm going to update, this is my take, I'm going to update uh, the Tug of War show that we did uh, roughly a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. And what I said back then, I'm bringing up, literally I copied and pasted this chart from the show. This is the S&P 500, and uh, I talked about a tug of war between 418 on the bullish side. This is for the SPY, uh, the ETF that mimics the, the S&P 500. Four, uh, 418, if we saw a breakout above there, I was becoming enthusiastic on the upside, and 393 uh, on the downside. That was then. Here's now. Uh, you know, we're below 393. So the tug of war has gone to the bearish side. The 200 day moving average is now turning down. The volume is picking up on the down days, as you see by this arrow here. And so my metaphors have changed from tug of war turns to vice. I talked about in that show about earnings versus interest rates. Earnings were lousy and coming down, and, and interest rates, Fed, uh, Powell, Fed Chief Powell had just talked, to, he said disinflation 13 times at the, at the, uh, the meeting after the, 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 the Fed meeting, and, uh, and so people were saying, okay, rates are going to go up maybe a little, uh, and, and then we're going to be done, and we're gonna, interest rates are going to start to help. Well, the subsequent economic numbers, especially the employment numbers, have indicated uh, prior to this banking fiasco, rates are going to go up 50%, and then we'll see what goes on, on from there. So rates were going to be continuing to be a negative, hence the vice. Earnings stink, interest rates stink, there's the vice, and stocks go down. And um, now the narrative has altered a little bit, but I'm not so sure it's... it's uh, even more bearish, because now well, the Fed can't raise rates too much because the banking fridge uh, system is so fragile that it can't take it. And so that to me means 
Uh, you've got you know two negative countervailing forces. I think they still raise rates next week when they meet, and the commentary is going to be fascinating. But uh, this is clearly resolved to the downside in this tug of war. And so my take is, uh, as I uh, dribble down the court, and I know that's a bad image, uh, I'm leaning towards the bearish side, but the market's always going to tell me what to do. And uh, uh, but I want to keep you apprised of the way I'm leaning, so that when you when you uh, subscribe to my newsletter and you see what I do the days in between these shows, that you're not surprised by by some of the investments that I make uh, for uh, my wife and my sons and I. So those are my big takes for the week. And uh, you know, as we close out today's show. I know bank failures isn't isn't a, is is a you know obviously not a, a, a fun topic. So I always like to end with some much needed levity. Here's one of my personal favorites. Uh, uh, Jack just mentioned me the other day. Uh, Raviolis in a nap. John Panette. I don't do ups. Uh, may he rest in peace. I miss him. And uh, it's four minutes or so, and it's well worth it. And I think we all need to, uh, to laugh, especially given what's going on out there. So that's it for today's show. Please email me, bakes at stockmarketauthority.com. Please uh, uh, tweet me at bakes takes uh, underscore. And, uh, and please go to my website, stockmarketauthority.com. Sign up for the free newsletter. Hope you have a great week. Fire your questions and comments to me. I'll see you soon. Take care. God bless. Bye now. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.